Hi, this is a video covering a hardware project that I have been working on for mid to late 1990s era game console implementations within an FPGA. This proposed hardware platform would have the potential to supersede the current MISTER platform for retro computer FPGA implementations and allow for future growth and expansion. Let's begin by revisiting the table of game consoles over the generations from my first video on game console emulation. Each of the consoles along with their CPU models and maximum clock frequencies are listed. The first grouping are the already existing or potential candidates for the current MISTER platform. Currently I know of a PS1 that's in the works for MISTER, and it's possible that an N64 core could also be produced for the MISTER, though it would be a very tight fit. It's also likely that an N64 would not be possible on the Cyclone 5 due to the way block RAMs work in the Altera devices, though that's a topic for another video. The next grouping are the devices that have a clock speed that is far too fast for an FPGA implementation. While it may be possible to implement the hardware itself within an expensive FPGA, games would not be playable on them, operating between 1 5th to 1 20th of the original speed. Then there are the extended candidates for a high-performance FPGA implementation, but will not be implementable on the current MISTER platform. These would be good candidates for a high-performance FPGA, which has more logic units than the Cyclone 5 used by the MISTER. The N64 is highlighted here, since such a platform should allow for native hardware upscaling at render time, something that would not fit on the Cyclone 5, along with the N64 core. And finally, there are two candidates for a pseudo-emulation approach. These would, however, be mutually exclusive, where a platform would only be capable of implementing one of the two. Due to the popularity and state of software emulation for the GameCube, the better option would be an Xbox implementation, which most likely could be done using a Pentium 3 processor attached to an FPGA via the Intel frontside bus. Pentium 3 processors are still widely available from China, so this is a feasible option. While the implementation candidates for a new platform are not numerous, there is a set of candidates which are not shown here, 90s era computers, i.e. not game consoles. The ones that I am most interested in, which have not been successfully emulated to my knowledge, are the SGI computers such as the Indy and the Onyx. Those fit somewhere between the VR4300 and the PlayStation 2 in terms of implementation speed. In my first video, I proposed a hybrid implementation platform in which an ARM SoC with a GPU is connected to an FPGA via a PCI Express, the PCI bridge. While I think this is a good solution to the problem, it is not the most ideal economically. The reason for this is that the cost introduced by the ARM SoC doesn't seem worth it. This would result in a platform cost of around 600 US dollars. Similarly, we don't want an SoC FPGA due to forced resource sharing, which the Cyclone 5 has. I had also looked at the possibility of using an Intel-based SoC, however the cost there was again much higher, resulting in a cost of around 800 US dollars. I also played around with the idea of developing a platform capable of connecting to an existing single board computer via an M.2 slot, which I ended up abandoning due to the compatibility issues between single board computers. After exploring different options, this is the result that I came up with. It's similar to the original platform, with the change that instead of using an ARM SoC, it instead exposes a PCI Express card edge connector and takes on a full-length PCIe card format. The reason for doing this is that it would allow for maximum compatibility with existing single board computers as well as desktop systems. The SD RAM was replaced with a DDR3 SODIMM slot which would have the memory bandwidth required for a PlayStation 2 and Xbox, as well as a socket 478 for the Pentium 3 processor connected to the main FPGA via an Intel frontside bus. There were, however, two issues to solve with such an implementation. How do we deal with the user interface, and how do we program and configure the device? For the first problem, the original idea was to have the ARM SoC draw the user interface as well as the output from the FPGA. While this would still be possible if a webcam interface were used, it would only work with specific single board computers and not desktops. The solution came from a few smart TVs which use an ASIC to combine the HDMI stream from their onboard SoC and the video decoder for media playback. In these cases, the UI is generated by the SoC and encodes a transparency map to allow for a semi-transparent UI to be displayed atop the stream from the video decoder. 
As far as I know, such ASICs are not commercially available and are often proprietary. However, it should be fairly straightforward to implement one in a Spartan 7 FPGA with an added onboard DDR3 memory chip to act as a frame buffer to synchronize the two streams. The Spartan 7 could also allow for the HDMI input to be passed straight through to the output, disconnecting the main FPGA from the video loop altogether. An obvious question that one might ask is why not simply use the PCI bus to have the main FPGA draw characters to the screen like the Mister does? The answer to that question is resource usage. While the pixel engine for drawing the menus on the screen for Mister is not particularly large, it does use resources which could otherwise be used by the FPGA cores. It's for this reason that the only pre-allocated block on the Arctic 7 is that of the PCI bridge in which several low resource cores exist using less than 0.5% of the total FPGA resources. Ideally, no other cores or controllers would be required allowing for maximum device usage. In fact, the PCI core would not be needed, though another method of communication with the outside world would be required. To do this, there is the configuration bus for the FPGA as well as an I2C bus which is not shown and are both directly connected to the Spartan 7. The second problem of programming the device could also be solved with the Spartan 7. Originally, the idea was to connect the Spartan 7 directly to the single board computer via a LPC bus. However, this once again led to compatibility issues. After a bit of searching, I came to the conclusion that the best solution would be to use an onboard USB 2.0 header, which allows this platform to act as a USB device. The header can then connect to a FT232H USB to high speed SPI chip, which could communicate directly to the core within the Spartan 7. Note that the original plan was to use the PCI to PCIe bus to allow for the main FPGA to communicate with the ARM SoC, which would emulate the drive and game controller or keyboard and mouse functionality in software through SATA and USB connections respectively. This would still be possible in this implementation. Additionally, it should be possible to use a USB to PCIe adapter board or a Thunderbolt to PCIe adapter to connect such a platform to any SPC, such as a Raspberry Pi for example. The main goal was to allow this platform to connect to any media computer, allowing for both FPGA-based cores as well as software emulation and media streaming, while also keeping the overall cost low. An initial estimate for such a platform would be around $400, US more than half of which goes into the cost of the main FPGA. This is still quite high when compared to the Mr. FPGA, though this platform would be easily expandable to play original game media as well as operate faster and with significantly more logic resources than the Cyclone 5 in the Mr. In turn, this would mean bigger and more complicated FPGA cores would be possible. For comparison, the cost goal for this proposed platform is much lower than equivalent PCI Express based cards currently on the market, which would usually sit around $800 US or higher, with fewer features that would be useful for retro hardware implementation, such as a PCI expansion slot. As a quick side note, I would like to justify why the target platform uses a Xilinx Arctic 7 instead of the Cyclone 5E used by the Mister. This isn't meant as a jab at the Mister or an effort to downplay the work that has been done there. This is just an alternative. So there are a few reasons for this. Making the Arctic 7 a better FPGA choice in the context of future retro hardware FPGA cores. The Arctic 7 simply has more logic elements. The largest Arctic 7 has about 50% more logic elements than the largest Cyclone 5E. The reason for this being a benefit should be obvious, but if a more advanced core such as a PlayStation 2 can operate at the required speed but does not fit in the device, then it's useless. The 7 series, which this is true for all 7 series chips, not just the Arctic 7, has faster I.O. buffers and faster internal architecture. For reference, the 7 series has soft core DDR controllers, as well as the ability to support 1080p HDMI via a soft core, whereas the Cyclone 5E requires dedicated hardware blocks for these capabilities. The downside is that the soft core requires the usage of internal resources, while the hardware blocks do not. The benefit being that you can easily use any core, including third-party ones, and have any interface that the engineer wishes. Additionally, the 7 series allows for internal implementations to clock at a higher frequency than the Cyclone 5E. The 7 series also has more versatile architecture, which means that it has fewer specialized units, which in this context allows for better and more efficient resource utilization. The 7 series also allows for asynchronous block RAM reads by default. This is a problem that many FPGA developers have noticed with the Altera slash Intel FPGAs. 
where the block RAMs require an extra cycle to read. In other words, a clock transition must occur between when the read address is available to the block RAM and when the read data is displayed. The 7 series allows for same cycle reads, though can also implement synchronous reads like the Altera block RAMs. This is important for implementing cores that require half cycle register reads like the MIPS processor line. The solution in an Altera FPGA would be to use two clocks, one operating at twice the frequency of the CPU clock, which adds additional complexity. The 7 series also has the ability to implement distributed lookup table based RAMs. Note that this is not the same thing as distributed register memory. In this case, each lookup table acts as a 64 entry 1 bit memory with a read port and a write port. Most likely, this was implemented to allow for register files and FIFOs. The other aspects of the two FPGA families are similar. However, the only benefit that the Cyclone 5E has over the Arctic 7 is that it's cheaper. I should mention that higher end chips like the Stratix and the Kintex would be better options, but those would easily push the platform cost well over $1,000 and required the paid version of the compilation tool which is priced at large companies and not individual consumers, so it's very expensive. Both reasons effectively throw out those chips as a feasible option. Once again, this is not to say that there's anything wrong with using the Cyclone 5E, it's just that the Arctic 7 would be a better option going forward, allowing for larger and more performance intensive cores. As I had mentioned, it would be impossible to fit an N64 core working at 1080p native resolution within a Cyclone 5E, and would be also impossible to implement a PlayStation 2 within one. One more thing to mention is that the Cyclone 10 may be an alternative option, though as far as I'm aware, it still has yet to be widely adopted. Perhaps in a few years, that would be the ideal FPGA to use. However, for now, I'm going to assume that the Arctic 7 is currently the best choice. To show that this is not just a random proposal, here is the 3D view demonstrating a potential layout in KiCad, which currently has all of the pins mapped out and allocated for the FPGAs. For reference, here are the major components from the previous diagram. The PCIe to PCI bridge is not shown, as it's on the back side of the board. While the final platform would probably not be routed and designed in KiCad, going for something like Altium instead, the DDR3, both for the Spartan 7 and the Arctic 7, have been fully routed to establish the required board area. The Spartan 7 has also been fully fanned out along with the Socket 478. Eventually, I will probably do a crowdfunding campaign to develop this platform further. However, I would like to have a working N64 core before doing so to better justify the platform. Given the time required to develop such a core, this probably won't be made into a product for several years, at which time there may be better hardware candidates available at a lower cost. Note that all of the Mr. Cores should be synthesizable for this platform with minor modifications, mostly switching to the Xilinx IDE, Vivado, as well as moving from the HPS bus used by the Cyclone 5 SoC to the PCI bus. One further point to mention is that while this is not shown since this is an older render, plan is to extend the PCIe connection from X1 to X4. The PCIe to PCI bridge will only accept an X1 connection, however. The X1 connection can have SMD bridge resistors attached in such a way they can be easily resoldered to connect the PCI Express connector directly to the Arctic 7, allowing for this platform to act like any other PCIe FPGA development board. This may not be of interest to the retro FPGA hardware implementation community, but could have potential applications elsewhere. An example of such an application would be implementing a consumer-grade FPGA-accelerated real-time ray tracer. Think of NVIDIA RTX, but more capable. Altera, for example, released a video in 2008 demonstrating a real-time ray tracer on one of their FPGAs. In this situation, the PCIe to PCI bridge chip would be disabled, however the Arctic 7 would still have the option to act as a PCI master for the expansion slot since it would still be electrically connected, and therefore PCI wires could then be used as I.O. to connect to other devices. And one final note on this design is that of the power supply. While not shown, the current design allows for a 12 volt ATX PCIe power connector for use with an ATX power supply as well as a 12 volt DC barrel jack. This would also have a secondary header which can supply 5 volt DC to power other SBCs, as well as allow for the ATX power connector to be used as a 12 volt power output when using the barrel jack. This would allow for boards like the Latte Panda to be powered via one external power supply instead of the default and an ATX power supply. 
There is one potential problem that should be addressed in regards to this proposed platform. While the Arctic 7 is much larger and faster than the Cyclone 5E, it's possible that some of the candidate cores may not be fast enough or may not fit within the device. Specifically, I am thinking of the PlayStation 2. I'm certain that an N64 and an Xbox chipset would fit within the Arctic 7 and be capable of operating at the required speeds. I am, however, not confident that a PlayStation 2 could. The problem is that once multiple components are added, they quickly consume the device resources from both primitive elements as well as routing interconnects. I was recently working on an FPGA core for a low-cost product which barely fit within the device despite not using all of the logic elements. Additionally, the implementation was incapable of operating at its original maximum frequency, though it was still able to meet the timing constraints for the product. So with that said, unless newer, faster, and larger hardware is released between now and the time of developing this platform further, it would be a gamble as to whether or not it could support a PlayStation 2 core. Unfortunately, this becomes a chicken and egg problem since there are no current development kits, at least for the Arctic 7, which would provide the required memory bandwidth to develop a PlayStation 2. So such a platform would be required to find out if it could fit a PlayStation 2. There are other potential solutions, however, which fall under the category of hybrid software FPGA implementation, so all hope would not be lost in such a case. And finally, I would like to leave this video with my current development roadmap. I have been asked a few times whether or not I am actually working on an N64 core, or if these videos were just mostly for educational purposes. While they are for educational purposes, I am also working on an N64 core, as well as a few other cores. To this date, the most completed block is that of the VR4300, though I have some work completed on all of the blocks, ranging from technical reference research, to detailed design documents, and block diagrams, to initial logic implementations. A few notes regarding this roadmap. The first is that the difference between the VR4300 with and without the floating point unit is only within the control state machine. So all of the internal pipeline components required to fully cover the MIPS-3 floating point instruction set are currently within my VR4300 core. Since the R3150 contains no floating point unit, however, completion of the control state machine is not required. The second note is that the horizontal layout shows dependencies but does not align in time, i.e. it would be insane to be simultaneously working on the RSP, the R5900, and the SPU. The actual order will be to complete the R3150 with GTE before or in parallel to the VR4300 with floating point, and then completing the N64 before starting the R5900. The dependency of the R5900 on the VR4300 is to indicate that many of the components and architecture are similar. So in short, yes, I am currently working on all three cores with various levels of progress. However, completing the N64 core alone will most likely take another 3-5 to five years, let alone a PlayStation 2 core. Anyway, I am going to leave the video here. Hopefully you found it interesting. If anyone has any questions or comments, I would be happy to answer them in the comments below this video. Thanks for watching.